Ivy Nation Sports Talk, up and rolling on a Wednesday. Glad to have you here. He's Jesse Styers. I'm Sean Styers. We'll be here. It's pretty much the Sean and Jesse week here on the show, the way things have turned out. Hey, Ryan Roberts just checking in right now. So, uh, oh, Joe, waiting on Jesse. No, we weren't. We were actually having a little chat about um, <laughs> baseball cards and, and uh, NFTs in 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 the back before we got going everyone's favorite topic baseball i uh yes <laughs> i was telling you jackson holiday making his mlb debut today i bought his rookie card i'm invested it's pretty cool see that's crazy like nobody used to buy rookie cards before a guy even made his <laughs> debut you know it's like you went back two years later and tried to find the rookie card because the guy had turned out to be that great but Calling my um, shot. I'm just just old and gray and thinning and <laughs> everything else. Thing on top anyway. Well, it's mailbag night, and we've got a ton of questions. I was going to say, when questions. Vince and I are up on mailbag, it's like we're begging for questions. And now I, I come into this one, you already have 20 of them start. Boom. We're ready to go here tonight. We've got all kinds of good stuff sitting by and ready to go and i'm sure we'll get more before it's all over i was looking through them and there, there are some pretty good ones um so let me see let me let me find the first one that i wanted to talk about there are a few good ones and let's just start with dk's super chat thank you for the super chat to start us off here tonight dk why is mike uh, what sorry go we ahead went over the format you're reading i know i know i'm 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 antsy i'm antsy here tonight <laughs> mailbag why is Micah Gilbert, a.k.a. the greater one, I like that, the best freshman wide receiver to put on a Notre Dame jersey since Michael Floyd? I also like that comparison, the, the Michael Floyd comp. Yeah, maybe not quite as big as Michael Floyd, but he's uh, he's got a combination of twitch and some frame to him, which I like, and just kind of you know seeing him out there on the field and that explosiveness that he's got. That's what, that's what kind of – you know, like you said, that that Michael Floyd comp, the explosiveness, I think, is um, is is really where I see the comparison between those two guys. I mean, I I, I know that you know DK is is kind of taking it at, at least a half shot, if not a three quarter shot, at so at salty on this one because of the great one. Those are some relatively big shoes, sort of uh, to follow. Jaden Greathouse last year because I think Greathouse was you know he was on his way to a really good freshman season if he hadn't gotten hurt. Who had a more year. impactful freshman season, Jaden Greathouse or Jordan Faison? Ooh, I think when it's all said and done, Faison did just because of health. Yeah, and just yeah, like Faison, not literally necessarily, but just from a production standpoint. I mean, Faison got to make his debut because of, you know, Jaden Greathouse was was injured and, and Jaden Thomas was injured. And that you know, like that's why he that's why they put him in uniform. That's why they used him. That's why they ultimately, you know, when they did all those things, they had to give him the scholarship. I'll say that I will say he had more impact down the stretch over overall for the entire season compared to great house great house. I think, you know, again, if he hadn't been injured, he was on his way to having huge impact, but unfortunate injury. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Micah Gilbert question, I'm glad you went first because I, I've quite literally seen nothing of him, right? Like you've got the opportunity to at least see him work in some, some individual drills. I don't, I think you guys have been to a full practice as well. Um, but you know, I missed Mike, that one. I was gone with women's. I think that was ACC tournament. Okay. But I'll get to see the full practice. We just got the details of the full practice that we get to see this Saturday. So, yeah. So like, you know, looking at Michael Floyd was like, I think like six foot two, three, four around two twenty five. Michael Gilbert's like six, two in that same range, about two Oh five right now. Like I think Micah Gilbert, if he puts on just a little bit more muscle, like I, I do see him as someone with like the, the Michael Floyd potential because of 
the ability to go up and like high point a football that it Michael Floyd, whenever you threw the ball, you felt like he always had a chance mm-hmm. to make a play on it. Right. Like I don't think great house is that sort of wide receiver and that's fine. Like I don't, I don't see him as like a, again, like a body, like a Des Bryant type wide receiver or a Devonte Adams type wide receiver, you know, like big frame, you can throw up the ball and they're just going to go up and get it. I do think Micah Gilbert is more of that guy. And I think the, the way you have to look at it is how, how can someone like Micah Gilbert compliment someone like Jaden Greathouse because they are two different types of wide receivers, but I'm excited to see him. I've been missing that type of wide receiver at Notre Dame. Like I, I want a big frame 50, 50 guy where, you know, sometimes you just throw it up and say, let our, let our guy win. You know, I'm anxious to see if he fits in the rotation, where he fits in the rotation as a freshman, because again, because of the veterans that they have not quite as necessary as, you know, guys like great house and Rico Flores last year, but I, I will be curious to see where he ends up on that depth chart. And, you know, if he's, if he's able to kind of carve something out as a true freshman, Sean Kelly's got a wide receiver question as well. I see. Will Bu is that his name? Bo. Bo Collins be able to do summer workouts and go th- go through training with the quarterbacks. Not sure on the rules for summertime. Yes, he will be here this summer. He'll get here in June. Basically, he just he has to this academic 2023-24 school year has to end so that he can begin officially working out with the team and doing all that stuff. So as soon as the spring semester is done, then he can start working out with the team. They'll they'll begin their summer stuff in June and summer school in June, and he will be able to be full go out there with everybody, everybody else this summer. So that's good news. What about this one from Andre? Andre wants to know my feelings for Notre Dame football in 2024, our playoffs, final four. Do you believe that's too much to ask for? What do you think about that one? Playoffs and final four. Not just getting to the playoffs, but final four. Is that Remind, too much is it, to ask? Is it 12 or 10 teams? 12. It's 12 this year. 12 this year and next year, and then it goes to 14 after that, three years from now. So Notre Dame would, uh, under that format, Notre Dame would have to win two games to make it down to the final four. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say my expectations are make the playoffs and win a playoff game. I don't know how far down the line I am quite yet. Um, let me put it like this, though. If Riley Leonard is 100% healthy, doesn't have to miss any time, I would say that I think my ceiling would be a, a Final Four appearance. I think that with this offense and the talent that's around and Mike Dimbrock's ability to – or I guess I should say the stuff that we've heard out of Mike Dimbrock wanting to scheme guys open more, I think that has me really excited because I think Notre Dame does have the athletes to compete in space. Um, I just think they need a dude at quarterback, and I don't – I don't think that's going to be Angeli or anyone, uh, anyone other than Riley Leonard. Like a, a very healthy Riley Leonard, I think they they can, they they have a fighting chance with anyone because of how well their defense is. And I I mean that's assuming again that the defense doesn't take any step backs, and you know a step back this season. But yeah, I think a, a, a healthy Riley Leonard, I would say that a comfortable ceiling would be the Final Four. I somewhat agree with that. Like I. I I think I agree more with what you're talking because you you know we don't know what the matchups are are going to look like or you know any of that kind of stuff and you know where Notre Dame's going to be seated any of those kind of things. I, I would say making the playoffs and you know at least winning a first round playoff game, which gets you to eight. And I realize that'll still that'll disappoint some people because they'll go, oh well, you know, for you didn't even get to. The four, you know, to the to the semifinals, which is where you used to get when when you got into the playoffs and those kind of things. So that that won't make some people happy, but especially if you get a chance to host that first round playoff game, win that first round playoff game, hopefully get frigid, you know, Arctic temperatures at Notre Dame Stadium in December for that first round 
playoff game and at least be in contention in that next round to potentially make it to the final four. That's that's where I would be. I would call that a successful season. Cuz this is a little bit it is a little bit of a transition season, but at the same time there's a lot on the line this season. Like third year head coach Marcus Freeman, third year is is where Notre Dame coaches have typically made their move if they're going to make a move, you know, Lou Holtz, Brian Kelly go on. My know, thing is for that. Not only is this the biggest year, but this is the most talented roster and coaching lineup I think we've seen in the last three years as well. Like all of the pieces have come together. I think Marcus Freeman has in in some ways flushed out kind of the people that he inherited or maybe some of the players that he inherited. Mm -hmm. And this is a more Marcus Freeman staff and roster, what he would prefer. And so I think you're going to start to see some of that. I, I think Marcus Freeman really has – the guys that he wants at all levels. And a good follow-up from Michael here as well. Is winning a playoff game in a 12-team format as big an accomplishment as a playoff win in, a, in a, the four-team format? No. no, because in the four-team format, it's more selective. So by definition, that's a bigger accomplishment because you're already one of the final four team and you get to the, the championship, championship game. But at the same time, you obviously can't, you know, like you can't get to a championship game if you don't win that first round game, you know. So it's not as big an accomplishment, but it is an accomplishment. And I still think that when you, you know, when when we look at Notre Dame hasn't won a major bowl game since 94 and, you know, all those different things, the 30 year drought and all that stuff. I do think that winning a first round playoff game would be the equivalent of winning, you know, that you're playing, you're playing competition that is similar to a, uh, a new year six bowl right now. So it would be at least similar, you know, or, or on the same plane as that, like winning a new year six type bowl. Let me ask you this, speaking of new year six bowls and, you know, Notre Dame struggle and in, in said games, you know, last few decades, um, did you know Chad Ochocinco played for that Oregon State team that beat Notre Dame? I did. I was there. <laughs> I didn't know that. And yes. he just transferred. That was the only season he played at Oregon State because he came from like a junior college or something, was there. <laughs> the only reason I know this, I listened to a podcast with him recently, and they, they were talking about, you know, how long were you in college for? And he was like, well, I only went, you know, played Division One football for four months. And then I ended up getting drafted because he went from JUCO to Oregon yeah. State to he and getting drafted. But I did not realize that um, he played on that Oregon State team. He and TJ Hushmanzada were both on that team. Really? Yeah. I didn't know. Well, obviously, I knew they were teammates on the Bengals, but I didn't know they were teammates yep. on Oregon State as well. Yes, they were. You know, you learn something new every day. <laughs> What year was that? I have an excuse. Like I was like that was the let me think. I think that was the two thousand the, the the two thousand season. It would have been so. Yeah, I was like a whopping season. like five years five. old, four years <laughs> yeah, exactly. old, exactly. <laughs> as we were on the cusp of moving to South Bend. I was going to say because that was I had just moved to South Bend, and that was one of the you know first. You know, in addition to covering Notre Dame football home games, got to go to the Fiesta Bowl that year, only to see him get waxed, unfortunately. But <laughs> okay. it was my first trip to to Arizona, to the Fiesta Bowl, all those different kinds of things. So, so you remember it very well. It's a cool experience, other than how it Getting ended. Destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Joe says he is jealous that the IB team gets to see the team before the rest of us. And honestly, if it's a scrimmage th that, you know, the way it's been explained, then we're actually going to see a lot of really good stuff. Like, I think we're going to see more this Saturday, potentially, than we see in the Blue Gold game the following week. So definitely looking forward to that. This Saturday. At Notre Dame Stadium. Joe also wants to know, he's got a question for us. Oh, man. I like this game. You know what? I got, like, all of these right last year. Did you? 
You remember that? I, we did the captain's thing, and I think I got like all but one right. Interesting. Okay. I can't believe you never remember the the stuff that I do well. <laughs> I remember Rocco, Rocco Spindler. Spindler. Are you going to yeah. read the question or not? Or like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> mailbag. Who would be your two early to pick team captains? Um, I'm pulling up the depth chart. Right I'm going now. Xavier Watts, Howard Cross. Oh, okay. On defense, I'm going. I don't know who to go with on offense because there's so much turnover over there. Like, would it be a Jaden Thomas potentially? Nope. I don't know. Like, it, it, I'll be curious to see if Riley Leonard ends up in that spot, like Sam Hartman did last year. I would have to go with Jack Kaiser. Kaiser's um, another good one. Forgot about him. And then offensively, and then Ashton Craig would probably be next, I think. I think you're going to have one offensive lineman. Um, I think the center is the most important He's about as veteran as anybody line. else. So I'm going yeah. go to so go with Ashton Craig. Ashton Craig. Okay. I'm having a hard time on defense, or not on defense, on offense. Ashton Craig is a nice, safe pick. I think I'll just stick with Jaden Thomas as one of my captains. Jesse is is having some issues, apparently. Um, DK trying to blame me for the curse of the Irish not winning a New Year's Six Bowl since I arrived. Remember, it, it predates me showing up because they lost – Another Fiesta Bowl when Lou Holtz was still the head coach. They lost to Colorado in the Fiesta Bowl. What was that, like 90? Naomi, are you on the Wi-Fi? <laughs> oh, boy. I think we're having Wi-Fi issues. Right oh, now. you're having issues, all right. You're having issues. No, no. My Wi-Fi is good. I mean, mine... I'm not seeing any issues at my end. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you just kind of keep locking up. Your free, your screen keeps keeps. Well, freezing. for me, it's you locking up. Oh, <laughs> so, so we're at a dilemma. Yeah, and I'm looking, and I'm showing full strength. We will let we will let the uh, we will let our viewers let us know. <laughs> I I like I like the frame that you set out. It's definitely. <laughs> um it's funny tommy guns you just i had literally muted and i just screamed at her i said get off the wi-fi <laughs> we, we heard that oh we you heard, heard that? that yes <laughs> i thought i was muted like as it was sort of freezing up we could hear you get off the wi-fi <laughs> <laughs> okay so sorry to this question has gone on a little long i think I'm definitely right. going Riley Leonard. I'm definitely going with Ashton Craig. I like a veteran wide receiver. Defensively, I like Jack Kaiser. I like Howard Cross, and I like Xavier Watts. Yeah. That would be my six right there. Yeah, Riley Mills could potentially find his way in there as well. We shall see. Salty's got a question for us. Auburn is switching from Under Armour to Nike. Is Under Armour doing enough in new contract for Notre Dame to stick with them? I'd like to take this one on first because okay. I saw this the other day, and my initial reaction was essentially the same thing. If Auburn, probably one of the other you know top significant brands that Under Armour hosts, is, is leaving, shouldn't Notre Dame get more because now they they have to basically do two-for-one work? You know what I mean? Like they Under Armour should now be rewarding Notre Dame in my opinion, for their loyalty and being the like the premier team I mean, under, under Notre Dame is basically propping Under Armour right up right now. I under think. Armour is standing know, on Notre Dame team sponsorships. Yeah. Um, but to answer the question, I've seen a lot of people who are upset about this. Obviously, it's what not even one year into the contract renewal with Under Armour, the contract isn't going anywhere. Like. 
a fair point that you're making, Jess, that if that if Auburn is out, should Notre Dame maybe get That's bumped up a little bit since they're losing so many high profile school prof, high profile schools, and Notre Dame is the most high profile of any of them. But I mean, the contract's not going anywhere. I'll just I'll just say that. I like what Josh was saying here. I like Mitchell Evans too to be a captain if he's not hurt. I really yeah. I looked at him for a really hard second. I was I was deciding between That's him and one. Ashton Craig, honestly. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. Everybody gets worked up about the Under Armour. Even after the contract is renewed, we're still talking about Under Armour a week later. Josh, Josh wants to know, does Juju have to transfer to a Midwest or East Coast team to keep the viewers coming in and NCAA women's basketball? Can the women take over as the most watched basketball entertainment? Um, well, you know, even though she's not on an East Coast team, she's going to be playing in a Midwest conference. So she's going to be playing in this time zone, in Central and East Coast time zone, you know, much more than she would have if, if USC was still in the Pac-12. You know, she's going to be playing against Michigan. She's going to be playing against Iowa, whatever Iowa looks like now, Ohio State, Indiana, you know, these these good schools in in the Big Ten. So and plus they have the L.A. market. And, and I still think that's why she's kind of gotten the hype that she's got, even though most of us here haven't seen her to any extent. But I don't know if the women take over as the most watched basketball entertainment. I do think that they're going to get a um, a spike. You know, they've they've they're going to get a spike in interest based on everything that we saw from this tournament, not just the Caitlin Clark games. And we'll get to that later in rapid fire as well. But I, I do think more people are going to like, they drew in some casual fans and I think a pretty good chunk of those casual fans are going to stick around now. And it's up to the younger players like Hannah Hidalgo, Juju Watkins, you know, you can throw Olivia miles and this, you know, most of this Notre Dame team into the mix, I think as well, you know, and if you want to include Paige Beckers, even though she's not young, but it's, it's up to this, this other core to, to keep people interested with their level of play. And so I think that it actually can help women's basketball. I think, I think USC women's basketball is going to get more exposure by the fact that they're going to be playing so many teams from the Midwest. I think that that is going to, uh, to help both her and potentially some continued interest in the overall women's basketball game. What do you think? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> if there is anyone that has the potential to fill the Caitlin Clark shoes, it is Juju Watkins. And if, if, if she can be what Caitlin Clark was, I do think that the women's game can continue um, <clears throat> to kind of be, you know, surpass the men's game ultimately. So, you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. I just feel like as of recently, the women's game has been more pure basketball. It's been more enjoyable to watch. And so I just think that now the women's game needs to find a way to continuously pass the baton to the mm -hmm. next star player. And, and I think that Juju Watkins is the next best person to pass the baton to just so young, the market she's from, you know, et cetera, the success that she had as a, as a true freshman. I just really like, I like that, you know, she would be the next person to kind of, again, maybe it's Hannah Hidalgo. You don't know, but someone's got to take the baton. I found a question here. I'm going to. Okay. Well, let's do this one first. I just put it up on screen. Go ahead. Sean wants to know, with Rocco practicing at left guard, buy or sell him starting at Kyle Field? AKA this is a good question. Then I saw this when I was – Stadium. Yep, down at Texas a and I'm going to buy this. Even though Coogan started all last year, I think Shrouth is going to be the right guard. And I think that ultimately – I think that we'll get a better snapshot depending on how much they let Rocco Spindler do in this you know, scrimmage this weekend and in the blue gold game as well. But I just have a feeling the way things are shaking out last spring, the line that we saw at the end of the spring was not the line that we saw take the field to start the season. And so I think that they are 
rewarding the guys who who they think are fully capable of going out there and getting the job done. And it's not that they don't think that Coogan can, but I think ultimately Spindler is going to end up being the guy. So I'll buy it. I'm buying it too. I'm going to be for a much shorter reasoning than you. I just think, I think Spindler's the toughest dude on that offensive line. I think he's willing to put his head through a wall if he has to. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. Like I, 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 Good genuinely, way of putting it. <laughs> I genuinely think that like he, he is just, and, and, and for a position that requires so much play after play aggression and domination, like that, he looks forward to that. You know what I mean? Like that's, He's one of those guys who just gets fired up after like any contact. Like he's the guy who would who would headbutt you with no helmet on to get fired up. You know what I mean? I just feel like he's he's just that intense, and that's the kind of guy that I want on the offensive line, even if he's got some deficiencies here and there, because I think he's going to give you his maximum effort every play. Well said. All right. So what do you got? You said you wanted to throw something up there. Yeah, let me find it. Is another good question from Sean. He actually had a bunch. I, I hope we can get to all of them. Um, mailbag. Will Riley Leonard be allowed to change the play at the line based on what he sees? Or is it only simple checks like ch like change which side of the line the run will go to? Um, I'll start with this one. I mean, I don't okay. 100% know. But I would assume that Riley Leonard would have the ability based on box count. I wouldn't even say change the play. I think Mike Dimbrock will have an offense that comes to the line of scrimmage with basically two plays in mind. And depending on what they see out of box count, that's what they're going to run. So that's where I think I would be most comfortable, you know, put, answering this question. I would think so as well. When you listen to Mike Dimbrock talk about how they want to use their personnel to take advantage of the defense and cause mismatches and it all, you know, make plays in space and doing all these different things. And they have a veteran quarterback who is obviously in his fourth year playing college football. And as we heard from him yesterday, the offense that he's going to be in with Mike Denbrock is not that dissimilar from what he was running at Duke. So it's something that he's very used to. And, you know, again, th this is something that, that we won't, no, until we get there. But one thing to remember is they're also going to have this year, assuming it gets passed. I think it might be tomorrow that they're doing the final vote on this. The uh, the earpiece and the headset is uh, is supposed to go through. They've actually been practicing with the earpieces this spring to get used to that. So that is something that can also, even if it's not Riley Leonard depending on when they get to the line of scrimmage and how quickly they see things, that is something that can also be called from, you know, the sideline or the press box or whatever it happens to be as Jesse continues to battle with his Wi-Fi issues there in Cleveland. Matthew Kettner asks, are we in trouble long-term when it comes to edge rushers? And other than RJ Oben this season, who will be the one the who who will be on the edge opposite him? And will that edge rusher carry over to next season? So before I address that, I would just say, Jesse, you might, you know, look into the uh the portable T Mobile tower. Like I've got I never have issues. <laughs> I have extremely high speed internet. You haven't had issues lately. There was kind of a run there where at the start of the show you were having issues like every night. But like I run so many like I have I have a VPN for work at the, on this computer. I run so many softwares a day and I never have issues, but as soon as I pull up StreamYard, I begin to have issues. There must be like a squirrel in the backyard chewing on a wire or something. Something all right, so we're talking about edge rushers now. He wants to know who the edge rusher is going to be opposite of R.J. Oban. I'm pretty sure it's going to be Batello this year. From what we've heard, Batello is having a good spring. And, you know, and I know that that's not going to make a lot of people happy, but what the other options are right now. You know, this, this is an issue that they've got, you know, like some of these young guys have to start stepping up and that and a combination of the recruiting continue needs to continue to get better there on the edge, you know, and, and I've you know kind of seen the, the Al Washington recruiting rumblings and stuff like that 
lately. It's it's got to be addressed. That's the thing. You know, like you can develop the guys, but you got to get those guys in there that are going to be big time. This is this is it, like there's a lot on Jordan Botello this year, but at the same time, the kind of athletes they're going to have in some other spots around him, just like last year. And I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And the fact that you have guys like Riley Leonard and Howard Cross inside. And then like Jason Onye was talking a couple of weeks ago when we got to talk to defensive linemen with his kind of quicker twitch body that like in third down passing situations, Onye would come in as a pass rush type nose guard as well. So they're going to get pass rush from different places, just like they did last year. But there's no doubt that those guys do need to step up. There, there's no doubt about that. You know, like you need to, we, we need to start seeing, you know, like Burnham is going to be, I think more on the Oban side. So like what he can contribute along with RJ Oban, you know, slash behind RJ Oban. And then what they get from that other Viper. Part of the Viper thing too, is you got to remember, it's like, it's not just a pass rush, pass rush position. position. Why am I getting tongue tied? Tonight. It's not just a pass rush position. That guy also drops into coverage. So that takes away from some sack opportunities and those kind of things. Like the the athleticism that those guys have to have. Yeah, I'm you, I'm I'm, I'm not gonna shake your head when I was point. talking about Botello earlier. Yeah, I, I I'm trying to selectively use words here. I am I am <laughs> not able That's to a good way to do it. Selectively use your words. I am not a Botello yep. fan. I now, this I, is fair, Michael. This is fair, Michael. I forgot about Bryce Young because we've only seen little bits of him so far, but he's he's a guy coming. He's coming for sure. So that's a good I, I don't think the defensive end position is a problem at all. I think the Viper is is a is is a, something to be concerned about. And I'm I'm just I'm beyond the Jordan Botello experiment. He's had plenty of opportunities, in my opinion. Um, I think it's time to go to Bobakar. I think it's time to go to Bryce Young. I think it's time to go to Junior Tui Alamaka. Um, but this this would go against everything I say because I, I rip on people who constantly say, you know, oh, well, if this quarterback isn't doing X, Y, Z, then the guy behind him has to be better, right? And so these coaches are at practice every day. They think Batello is the best. I just – I need to see something. I'm, I'm just so tired of it. I it, It's – it's the, there's just no production there. There's no consistent – production there and I think the thing that that gets me the most is I just don't know if Jordan Botello wants it as bad as everyone else does he just looks like a guy at the time who 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 doesn't necessarily care if he's performing how he's supposed to be and again maybe that's that's me no, and the I, the, but I I just I'm not a fan of him and I would I want to try something else <laughs> he reminds me a little bit of Chase Claypool like yeah that's a good comparison Uber you can talented. Chase Claypool got himself to the NFL because he was such a great athlete and was so talented, but the details, you know, like the, you know, when we hear coaches talk about details, consistency, all those different things, what Brian Kelly used to say, traits. I mean, Chase Claypool got by on pure ability and then he got to the NFL and you can't get by on just pure ability anymore because everyone in the NFL has a high level of ability. It's all those little things that set you apart and give you a long career. And right now, obviously, Jordan Botello is not even close to that. He hasn't gotten by enough on ability, and that's what he's got to do. He's He's got to start showing why he was brought here to begin with, because we've seen it in flashes in practice, and we've even seen it in flashes in a handful of games. We got to see it heck of a lot more consistently than what we've seen on Saturday so far. I love this comment right here. Yeah. Jason says if you, if you could fit a Heinish motor into Jordan, he could be really good. How many how many, you know, like those kind of conundrums do you see like <laughs> all the time? It's like if I could take this guy's ability and put it with this guy's desire, you'd have a great player. Yeah, that's and unfortunately, true. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, you can't make Frankenstein's monster on the football field or the baseball field or basketball or whatever it happens to be. Didn't Jordan win MVP in the bowl game for best defensive player? He did, but I brought this up a few Where times. Where was that the rest of the season? He yeah. gives us this inkling right at that's, the end. That's the flash. That's the flash right there. But as I've said 
when we've talked about Steve Angeli before, when people want to say, well, look what he did in the Sun Bowl when he went 15 out of 19 and threw three touchdowns. Okay, well, look at what Jordan Botello did in the Gator Bowl the year before that. We haven't seen that Jordan Botello since. So just because you flash, even in a bowl game, that doesn't mean that that's the guy that you're going to see game in and game out afterwards. And this is what I was getting at, Jason. I, I just don't know how bad he wants it on a day in and day, you know, day in and day out basis. Does he want it enough? Does he want to be great every single day? So that's where I get uh, a little bit frustrated. Ooh, I found another one that I liked here. Okay. A quick diverge. True or false? Will the Indians win the Central? Jesse? Um, I mean, it's going to be – the White Sox are going to be bad. Uh, the Royals will have Bobby Witt Jr. Um, <laughs> and Cole Raggins. So basically, it's, it's the Twins. And or, the Guards. Is this a trick question? Because Tommy, you know, put Indians up there. <laughs> a week ago, I felt really good about this. Um, but Shane Bieber is out. That's a guy that potentially, you know, that's their ace, a guy who was going to be, mm -hmm. you know, Cy Young. Um, I still, I, I, I wonder about their starting bull or their starting pitching depth. I think they have a really good bullpen. Um, obviously they still have Jose Ramirez, Josh Naylor, you know, Steven Kwan, Andre Jimenez, like those are gold glove, really good, consistent batters in your lineup. A couple young guys. I mean, it's just gonna be the same old, same old. It can't, who's going to. The, the twins and, and the guards are going to come down to the last week of the season. And who's, who's going to, one of those two teams is going to win the game or win the division by a game or two. So I just don't know if the, the guards have the starting pitching to keep up. Here's one from salty. Ryan Leonard is active to a degree in spring practice. Should we have any rep? Should he have any reps in the blue gold game? No, I'm going to say no as well. <laughs> there's nothing to gain by having him get any reps. Correct. Then there's a lot to lose. <laughs> he did some seven on seven at practice yesterday. Gino Gadulli was talking about that. The quarterbacks coach, he did some seven on seven stuff. So that's as close as he has come to anything live. I think I'm, I am interested to see what exactly they having, they have him doing this Saturday. Speaking of which, if good Freeman gave from the Tom. ability, how would Styers organize one full practice that's entirely available to the media? Scrimmage. It's what it's predominantly what I hope we're going to see this Saturday. Scrimmage, live stuff. See what see what guys do when the bullets are flying. Ones versus ones, twos versus twos. Like that's that's what I want to see. I, I, I want to see. Who's able to hold up when it's a um, when it's an actual live situation? As much live stuff as possible. That's, See, that's, Tommy that's, Guns, that's, that's how you evaluate people. I'll give you a better a better practice breakdown than this. I I would start with five periods of competitive of competitive periods. I want DBs or I want linebackers on running backs working drills. I yeah. want DBs on wide receivers working drills. And I want offensive linemen on defensive linemen working drills. Just, just that's to get the juices going. That's just to get everyone warmed up. And we do see a lot of that typically, you know, like at the beginning of a practice. When that's 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 a good way to start, actually. And that's something that Marcus Freeman has done is you know tried to bring in more competitive periods in practice. But even you know, like if it it's just it's not necessarily eleven on eleven or seven versus seven, but you've got quarterbacks throwing to wide receivers who are defended by cornerbacks like yes. that that's a good competitive period. or the one I loved was in me being a linebacker we would work moves on the running backs as they're trying to pass pass block like they would be protecting a quarterback so we're we're working our moves trying to win running backs are trying to block us you know assuming that it's a pass block or picking up a blitz those were always fun um, from there I would move on to inside run competitive so you have defensive line and linebackers, and then you have offensive line and running backs. So inside run, no passes at all, only work run. Uh, another competitive, probably five periods or so. Um, from there, I do five periods of competitive, seven on seven. And then from there, the rest of practice, I do a full team scrimmage and call it a day. Competitive period after period. Uh, I think that that would be great. You Because it would be so cool to see just the progression. You start in individuals, 
you move to inside run, you move to seven on seven, and then you're full team, but it's all competitive. Great plan. I love it. <laughs> Very detailed. I mean, you broke it out right away. Here's a good one. I, I, I just, I have to know. Mailbag, it's Masters week. How much will you watch? Um, Virtually none. <laughs> <laughs> I will watch Thursday and Friday because I can, I can put it on the computer while I'm working. Yeah. Friday and Saturday will, or sorry, Saturday, Sunday will be a lot harder because I have more going on, but I will definitely watch the first two rounds. I was thinking about going to watch some paint dry. And oh. I'm thinking that that might be a good occupation okay. of my time. So, <laughs> I see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, you know, I, you grew up in this house. You know where it's at. Like, not golf. No, it is not golf. Salty has a has a good draft question. Which Notre Dame players will be drafted in the first three rounds of the NFL draft? Um, definitely Joe Alt, maybe Audrey Gestime. I'm really curious to see where Audric Estime goes. Um, Dane Brugler, do you have an athletic subscription? I use yours. Okay. Have you have you looked at it today? No. Dane Brugler, the athletics uh, well-renowned draft analyst, just released his annual project that is known as The Beast. It is a breakdown of... I don't even know how many players at each position and how many total. It's it's well over. I think it's pushing 300 pages, but he has detailed breakdowns of all these players in the draft. And so I was looking at it today. He has Fisher, Hart, and Estime all projected like third, fourth round type okay. guys. So... I mean, we know Alt is a lock to go in the top 10. I'm just not sure where those, like, I, you know, and like I read the breakdown and I'll, I'll, I'll have some of it on tomorrow's show because I, you know, like for the mailbag today, you know, I wasn't, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about some of it on tomorrow's show, but I wasn't overly hyped about the kind of stuff that he was saying about Fisher, but it's the kind of stuff that we've talked about balance you know, like a strong guy, but like balance is going to be a big thing for him. And he's looking at Fisher as a developmental type guy, which, you know, again, as I've said, is a reason that Fisher should have come back for one more year at Notre Dame, because I felt like he had a lot to clean up if he if he wanted to be higher than just a third round guy. So I think all four of those guys could potentially end up the third. I'll say... Again, I'll say Alt for sure. Estimate is the seventh rated running back on Brugler's list. So I'll say he goes by the time the end of the third round is up. So I'll say three. I'll say three end up going in the first three rounds. One. One what? Joe Alt. That's it. In the first three rounds? Yep. Okay. I thought you already gave your answer and it was higher than that. Before. No, I said maybe Audric, definitely Joe Alt. But there's this just isn't a heavy loaded running back class with a lot of talent. So Audric being that low and and in my opinion, not a very talented class, I just don't I don't see that boating well for him to go in the top three rounds. Um how many guys do you think get drafted overall? For Notre Dame? Yeah. Let's see. Four. I'll say five. All uh, estimate. The guys we just talked about. All Hart, estimate. Hart, Fisher. Maris? Bertrand? Maris or Bertrand. I can't decide. <laughs> so you, you think Sam seems Hartman like, is. Seems uh, like teams have a pretty high estimation of Maris, though. I agree because of what we talked about. He has I didn't get skills. to the linebackers. I need to get to the linebackers and, and see exactly where those guys come in. He has skills that translate well to the NFL. So you think – I'm going to go – I think six guys get drafted. I think Bertrand and Maris both get drafted. I think Hart, SMA get drafted, um, and I think Alt get drafted. I don't think Sam Hartman is going to get drafted, but he'll end up on a on a roster somewhere. Yeah, 
I agree with that. I don't think he's going to get drafted either. I think he's going to be an undrafted free agent. All right, a lot of good stuff. I'm going to save some of these others for everyone's favorite. Are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. All right, so we're going to start off with a comment from Mr. Steve Angeli. He was asked yesterday about his consideration of the transfer portal. And here's what Steve Angeli said about that. Right now, my entire focus is on Notre Dame. Um, I'm a guy that lives in the present. You know, the future can be determined when we get there. It's mm -hmm. not my worry right now. All I'm focused on is these next, you know, five, six practices that we have left in spring and to give them all. So what do you think, Jess? I think, you know, by the sounds of it, I don't think Steve Angeli's going to go anywhere. I just... I think he's a Notre Dame lifer ultimately. And I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just, it's hard to say because as much as you, you know, love a program like Notre Dame, he's still going to get his degree early and have the opportunity to be a starter elsewhere. And it, for, for people who, you know, truly love the game, like I'm assuming Steve Angeli does, like he, he's going to want his opportunity. He's going to be, you know, Basically like a Drew Pine. Drew Pine got his opportunity because someone else got hurt. Had had Buckner got hurt, I don't think Drew Pine ever would have gotten that opportunity. He would have, you know, and then he would have just transferred out. But I think, you know, comparatively when looking at Drew Pine to Steve Angeli, the thing that works in, in Angeli's, well, I guess maybe not Angeli's favor, but maybe us as fans, Angeli, you know, barring any injuries, isn't going to get any starting time. So Drew Pine saw what he could do as a starting quarterback, right? And so he said he saw the results and knew that he could probably go play somewhere else. I don't think Steve Angeli is going to get that opportunity, you know, that that validation of, you know, I could be a starter someone else. So I, I think Steve Angeli is going to be going to be here for until he graduates. Honestly, I, I don't really see well, him being anywhere else. But that great see that graduation is a year from now, assuming he's on track to get his degree. But like they put him on that three year track. That's why they go to summer school and that's why they get him in here early and do all those different things. So a year from now, he should have his degree in hand. Not a year from exactly right now, obviously, but a year and a month, but what, 13 months from now when May rolls around. So there, there's no reason, I don't think, for Steve Angeli to head out this year because stick it out, get your degree in another year. And I mean, I'm just being honest. I think Steve Angeli is going to make at least a couple starts this season because of everything that we've talked about as much as, you know, no, nobody wants to see Riley Leonard have to miss any time, but with this, you know, with, with the injury stuff, I've just, I've just got to think that Steve Angeli is going to get a couple of opportunities at some point this season to come in and play. And that, that gives him a chance to show what he can do once again. So I think, I don't think it's this year, this spring, I think it's a year from now where after Riley Leonard is gone and then he's battling next spring with Minchie and CJ Carr for a starting job. I think that that's kind of the push point for Steve Angeli, not necessarily what's going on right now. I think we're on the same page with that, right? Yes. Okay. So Irish nose guard, Howard Cross, of course, was the guy who was responsible for the injury to Riley Leonard. Made that tackle at the end of the Notre Dame Duke game last September. So Leonard, this winter, when he first got here, he said Cross was going to take him to Roos Chris to make up for it. So we got to talk to Riley Leonard yesterday. Has that trip to Ruth's Chris happened yet? Oh, I Come still on. haven't gotten to Ruth's Chris <laughs> dinner. I don't know. I got to talk to him about that again. Um, like I said, he's still he'll walk. He'll, he'll walk by me in the locker room. Hey, Riley, I'm really sorry, by the way. Every day, like, sorry, Riley, I feel so bad. Like, you're good, man. He didn't do it on purpose. He's a great guy. So me and Howard kind of have that bond, I guess. So he's good natured about it, obviously, but fill in the blank. Howard Cross should do blank for not paying up yet. Howard blank, or sorry, Howard Cross should have to double up for not paying yet. I think at this point, he owes Riley Leonard two steak dinners, right? Like basically interest on the first one that he owes him. And 
you know, a, kind of a side comment here. Isn't Riley Leonard just so goofy? Like he just sounds like a, just like a happy go lucky kid most of the time. You know what I mean? Like he just, when I listen to Riley Leonard, I just can't help to think that he's just a little bit of a goofball. <laughs> I mean, he does seem pretty good natured, you know, and, you know, he's and he's taking it very well. He obviously holds no grudges against Tower Cross. They were just playing football. And, you know, like I, I you know, Joe, Joe Allen says steak dinner and a movie. I mean, I think at the very least he owes him two dinners and not a soup, you know, like he needs to take him. He needs to take him to the Roos Chris to pay up and then he needs to take him. Whatever Riley Leonard wants, Riley Leonard should get from Howard Cross. Yes. At this point, you got to pay up. You can't just say sorry in the locker room. You got to pay up, man. <laughs> Put your money where your mouth is. That's right. Okay. So I was on the L Lucky Lefty podcast yesterday with uh, Malik Zaire and Sean Davis. They asked me which of these two things will happen first a national championship for Notre Dame football or a national championship for Notre Dame women's basketball? What is your answer? Um. Well, first and foremost, I listened to that podcast yesterday. And I thought you sounded great, by the way. I took the dog oh, for a you. walk, listened to your <laughs> segment. And I, I couldn't – well, I could believe, but, man, they were really hyping you up on your – I know. Throw into the show yesterday. I thought that Don was Davis. Great. Like I know. They talk, need to pay you, that guy something. Talking about your, you were you are one of the best voices in in college women's basketball. I thought that was very nice of him, but I did too. I thought I think a national championship for the women's team is more on the horizon than the college football team. I just I thought the women's team, while performed really well this season, you know, but, but with a bunch of uh, injuries, I still felt like they were an elite eight team, and you know, being an elite eight team getting one of the top centers in the country, and that was Notre Dame's biggest kryptonite or hole in the roster this season, um, getting back Olivia Miles and pairing her with Sonia, Sonia Citron, you know, Maddie Westbelt, um, Hannah Hidalgo. Like, it, it's just I, – I talk about uh, an explosive roster. I, I definitely see the women having a, a more clear path to a championship than the, than the football team. I do too. I think they're just closer – right now they're yeah. already you know as you said they you know they were a couple play really two of the last three years they're a couple plays away from being elite eight teams in both of those years last year against Maryland in the sweet 16 not as much that wasn't quite as competitive but um you know they're they're on the verge and then you get back what you know what they're going to have coming back next year as I've said I completely expect them to be a final four team I just think they're closer now the way the roster is trending, though, for Notre Dame football, I think they're going to be in that conversation here within the next couple of years. But I'd still put women's basketball ahead of them in terms of who wins the next national championship. Uh, speaking of Notre Dame women's basketball, Salty, what's the status of the women's basketball players who could choose to enter the WNBA draft. The deadline to enter the draft was April 1st. So that is long gone now at this point. What is this? That was nine days ago. Maddie Westbelt did not enter her name in the draft in, you know, for the WNBA draft. And that was it, really. Yeah. That's that's pretty much it. So we still haven't got an announcement. From Maddie Westbelt, but I think she's going to be back here next year. Tommy, there is nothing more than I would be love to to be than than proven wrong that the football team and and they win a national championship this year. Trust me, yeah. The I women mean, have won two in my lifetime. I've never right. seen like a college football. I'm just answering the question of which I think is more likely. Yeah, like. You know, Joe Joe's saying the same thing. I hope the team proves you both wrong next year. Well, we all do, <laughs> right? But it's already been 36 years. Like, is there any more to any, any more right any more evidence right now that says they're going to win a national championship within the next year than there was two years ago or three years ago? Or do I believe they're ago? on the right trajectory compared to yeah. you know past? Yeah, I do. But they're moving in the right direction. I just don't think that they're quite there just yet. They could be with the defense that they've got. Like, 
maybe they maybe they end up being one of those teams this year. I think we'd all love to see it, but got to get to the playoff first. Got to win some games. It's going to be fun. So the NFL announced today that the Packers are going to play the Eagles Friday, September 6th in Brazil in week one of the NFL season. You like that? You like that matchup to kick things off to start the year? <laughs> Brazil. <Sure. laughs> yeah. Why not? Um, you know, I'll I'll always back the NFL up for wanting to expand the game. You know what I mean? Get basically allow the game to reach kind of areas that it hasn't have a you know impact global impact spread the game essentially but brazil and the, i mean they had to pick the eagles and packers for a reason right like they probably had to pick the most two popular teams in brazil. i mean it's a nice tv matchup yeah i mean those are you know the the eagles were a playoffs team the packers were a playoff team both of those teams still have upward projections for this season um yeah i mean i don't mind the matchup and I don't mind the fact that they're again trying different areas internationally to expand the game to. Like I like watching the games, whether they're in London, whether they're in Brazil, whether they're in Mexico City. Like I enjoy those things. I think it's it's fun when they do it. Sean Kelly wants to know if we're bigger Notre Dame or Cowboys fans. Who's going first? Me or you? You go first. I I have I have very good rationale for this. I'm a bigger right. Cowboys fan, but I'm a bigger Cowboys fan because I have more leniency for college players. I don't have leniency for, for for professional football players getting lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money. And it's not the same as the NIL. So no one put in the comments, you know, the, the stuff with the NIL. It's based off your name, image, and likeness, not your performance. These guys get mega contracts. And so when you got wide receivers who drop passes or, you know, I just don't have, I don't have the patience for mental mistakes in the, in the professional game. So I'm, I am a bigger Cowboys fan. Let me ask you this. How many players from the Cowboys do you think you could name from when you were like 12, 11, 12, 13 years old? How many, how many players? From that, from that. I mean, team. I could probably get at least fifty. You think you could get that many? Yeah. Okay. I think I could. I don't know if I could get fifty, but I think that I could get at least twenty from like for my 12, 13, 14 year old <laughs> range, and that's a lot. That's a lot farther away than yours. Correct. Right. Yes. Staubach, Danny White. <laughs> you want to count? Drew no, Pearson. I don't Tony think Hill, anyone else wants us to Butch count. Johnson, either. Golden Richards, Randy White, Two Tall Jones, Harvey Martin. I think you undersold yourself. I think you could get way more than you expected. Neely, Rafty, Donovan, backup tight end, Jay Saldy, Billy Joe Dupree, Cliff Harris, Charlie Waters, Everson Walls. Drew Pearson. I think I already said Drew Pearson. Preston Pearson, Robert Newhouse. So are you going to answer the question? I don't think I've heard your answer yet. You just had to push me, didn't you? <laughs> I'm sitting here hosting a Notre Dame show, and you just had to push me. <laughs> I'll just say it's easier to be a fan covering covering a college football team like Notre Dame, year in, year out, game in, game out. It's easier to be a fan of a team – that I don't have to cover all the time. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> because Again, I try I... to keep as much emotion out of, you know, when we sit here, you know, we break down games, we evaluate players, we do all this stuff, try to keep as much emotion out of it as possible, separate all that so that I can be as pragmatic as possible when trying to, you know, do this. But I, you know, I will say I I came here and, you know, ultimately because of the fandom that I had growing up as a Notre Dame fan. That's what brought me here. But it's easier to to be able to sort of compartmentalize and be a fan of a professional team that that I don't you know, that I'm not in on day in it's not your job out, the way. Yeah. The way I am here at Notre Dame, if that makes sense. So 
just to like I don't love them any less. They're they're like children to me. I'm just more a fan of the Cowboys because I expect more out of them. I have higher expectations because they are professionals, not amateurs. Right. And that too. Yeah. That's a good point too. I can I can live with a college player making a mistake because they're still a kid learning the game. But when you're in the NFL, you were selected to be the best of the best and getting paid a lot of money. So again, I have more expectations. Good answer. Good answer, Jess. So Mike Greenberg has compared Caitlin Clark to Tiger Woods for the impact that she had on the interest of the sport of women's basketball. Do you buy or sell that comparison? I 100% buy that comparison because there are people who will literally tell you, I don't watch golf unless Tiger Woods is playing, or I haven't watched golf until Tiger Woods played, or I'm watching this tournament this weekend because Tiger Woods is returning. You know what I mean? And I feel like it's the same thing for women's basketball. Like you, you mentioned, you know, Caitlin Clark is playing. I'm going to tune into that game. Like we talked about this in terms of the national championship. The reason why it did so many, so much, uh, or did better in numbers is because of Caitlin Clark, just a casual fan who turned in and said, I just want to see what the phenomenon is about. I want to see what all the hype is about. And I think it's the same with Tiger Woods and especially people maybe later generations who didn't get to see Tiger Woods in his prime. They've only heard about Tiger Woods, right? And so now you flip on Tiger Woods and you're like, I want to see some of that magic that everyone alludes to, right? And so that's the same type of comparison I have for Kit and Clark. People tuned in because they want to say, is it really what it is? Is she going to drop 30 points and, you know, make all these dazzling Steph Curry-like threes? Like, yeah, I, I think it's a fair comparison. I, yeah, I think it's a great comparison, actually. And, you know, Greenberg is typically Mr. Hyperbole and, you know, way over the top and, you know, lives, you know, solely, in, you know, in the in the moment. But I, I think it's one of the better comparisons, the analogies that he's ever made, because like I know that a lot of guys, women who listen to and watch this show are, you know, like I'm in my 50s. So I grew up in the 70s and 80s and growing up in that time. The sport of golf was basically an old white man's country club sport, you know, like it was not cool at all to play golf. And then along comes Tiger Woods and the sport gradually became younger. You know, like it, people wanted to, young people wanted to go out and play golf because of Tiger Woods. It became a lot more athletic. It became a lot more physical. And you look at, you know, all these young guys who are playing today and who have had success, you know, whether it's like Spieth or, or, you know, Rory, whoever it, it happens to be, they grew up watching Tiger Woods. And so he has had a major influence. And I think that, you know, you, you can kind of like, you're going to see like these girls who are, who are in middle school and grade school right now. I mean, <laughs> like they're going to drive some coaches crazy, but they're going to be putting up logo three pointers or they're going to be trying to put up logo three pointers, but you're going to see, I think you're going to see a lot of, you know, that copycatism that's going to be coming up here within the next few years. So I, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a great comparison just with the, for the overall impact and interest that Tiger Woods brought. I think that Caitlin Clark has done much of the same for women's basketball. And then Sean Kelly asked, if we buy or sell Woods being the most polarizing athlete in the last 20 years, I would sell it because I it's, you know, I'm going to say this name and I'm going to regret it, but it's LeBron. LeBron is the most polarizing athlete of the last 20 <laughs> years. I don't think, I don't think Tiger Woods is even in the same ballpark as him. I'm trying to like, let's, let's, let's try to go sport by sport. Okay. Golf, Tiger Woods, basketball, okay. LeBron James. Yeah. Who's football? That's what. Is it already Patrick Mahomes? I don't think he's got enough hate so far. Is it Brady? It's okay. It's definitely Brady. That's a good point. Okay. Um, baseball. Ken Griffey Jr. Barry Bonds. No. No, but, but like last twenty years. Albert Pujols. I mean, it could be Schilling now, but you know that again, like that dips into you know to waters that, that I don't yeah. want to get it. Yeah, but it's again like Schilling was not even 
beloved in his own locker room when he was playing. Right. You know, he, not even beloved. He wasn't liked by a majority of his teammates when he was playing. But he wasn't – it didn't seem like when he was playing, he was as polarizing when he took the mound. Roger Clemens, I'm just – you know, because this is the last 20 years, so there are a lot of names that you could throw. I would say – I would say Barry Bonds. I think Barry Bonds more than anyone. Okay. And then what about – I'd say Barry Bonds or Alex Rodriguez, I think would be my final two. Um, who's your college football most polarizing? Tim Tebow, Reggie Ooh. Bush, Vince Young. I would Young. say Bush. Reggie Re Bush. Reggie Bush. But does that even – does he – he barely gets in there in the 20 years. Just because – what? Or him or Manziel maybe? Johnny Manziel? Johnny Manziel is up there. Josh brings up Derek Jeter. I think Derek that's a Jeter's fair a really argument. Good one because he was a Yankee, and I think the that's, that's a really good one. Because, like, the Yankee thing and the fact that would he – he definitely would not have gotten, you know, near the love that he got had he not played for the Yankees and won all those championships. If he just accumulated the numbers on another team, he would have been a really good player, but – because he was a Yankee, that changed a lot of things. I think Jeter's a good one too. Tebow, take... Tebow was huge. That's that's a good one, Jason. Tim Tebow. Lawrence Phillips was he twenty years? I think he might have been a little bit more than than twenty years. Johnny, hot but take, Derek Jeter. I think Tebow's. I think Tebow's the answer for college football. I think that's Overrated. that's got to be it. Who's that? Derek Jeter. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a rod over Derek Jeter any day of the week. Wow. Okay, but now that as we, a player, as a player, as a are player, you factoring only, the steroids else. in there too. Statistics only. Oh come on! Everyone did steroids in in the in that in that window. <laughs> Everyone did steroids. You know that. Um, okay, but now that we've done each sport, are you still sticking with LeBron? Yeah. I don't think there's another player that is lived up to and simultaneously crushed the hype at the same time. And that's where I'll leave that one at. He's, he's shattering every, every basketball record ever. And he was, he was hyped up to do that. Not every player does that. So that would be my, uh, my final answer as well. Yeah. And no matter how much you hate him, dislike it, whatever it might be, it's, it's the answer. There's no other athlete who crosses political lines right now, who's as polarizing politically as LeBron James. And that's why the answer has to be LeBron yeah. James. And that's because why you once either politics love him or become, hate him. Yeah. Once politics become part of the formula, then you're, you know, it's just, it's automatic. You're one side or the other. So that's why it's Ooh, LeBron James. Salty come out of left field with this one. I like this. Yeah. The home run race between Sosa and McGuire. Brought a lot of fans back to baseball. Oh, so you're like, is this going back to what we were talking about? Like the comparison to uh, Caitlin Clark? Is that what Salty yeah. is talking about? That's a good one too. That's, a, But I still think, I, th I still think Tiger Woods for the cultural impact he had on the sport of golf and golf is still a young person's sport right now. And it was Tiger Woods made golf cool years ago. Yeah, Absolutely. And I don't think that you can say that baseball is cool right now. And I think the other, yeah, very much. And I think that the the part that's cool about Tiger Woods and compare like that comparison we were just doing, Clay, Caitlin Clark, I think you're going to see a similar trend. Like Caitlin Clark is going to influence a generation of players. You know right. what I mean? And that's what Tiger Woods did. He introduced golf to people who probably would have never played golf had they not seen Tiger Woods. Right. And that's why it also is important that, that she continues, you know, like Diana Taurasi, you know, with her stuff. Oh, you're going to play these old women now. And, you know, we're, you know, like it's not going to be easy coming in. But, I mean, they're going to market the heck out of Caitlin Clark in the WNBA. And, like, that's got to – she's got a chance to really lift that whole sport as well. You know, like the WNBA as opposed to – college basketball she's got a chance to really popularize that i think that i saw today where where was it that something like 20 of 36 
Indiana Fever games are going to be nationally televised this year, and it's all because of Caitlin Clark. So I'll be curious to see if uh, if the interest in the WNBA really spikes with the Clay- Caitlin Clark effect. As for like the the women's game of college basketball, the tournament obviously set multiple viewership records this year. So do you think that it's going to survive like the popularity will survive Caitlin Clark's departure to the WNBA. Will it stay as popular as it's been this season? I'm just going to have to say no, because I don't think we've seen a clear handing of the baton. Like we've talked about, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I, I still think we need to know who that player is going to be going for like who's the next Caitlin Clark I think until we kind of know that I can't definitively say but I'm just right now like she's a once in a lifetime player so I just I have to say no for now I I just think it I need to I'm a, I'm a person of you know numbers you know this I need to see it consistently <laughs> before I can you know what I mean make that it, it this is the first time right. ever so what what evidence Here's, do I have to say that think that this well, is going to continue to happen Here's what's interesting. Obviously, her games had the biggest spikes in numbers, the record viewership. But there were 57 overall women's March Madness games on, you know, on all the ESPN platforms. They averaged 2.2 million viewers. That is a 121 percent increase from a year ago, which, which makes it the most watched NCAA tournament ever. So. It's not, it wasn't just her games. There was also, now obviously her games helped boost that average, but at the same time, there was more overall interest. They, they, she helped draw in a lot of casual viewers. A lot of those casual viewers will stay around because they're like, huh, fundamentally, this is a better game than the college men's game, for example. You know, like, and there's like, they found out that there's more to like about, I think, the women's game than they thought there was going to be. So they're not all going to stick around, you know, on that level. But I do think that, you know, just a year ago, the record for a championship game was a little over 10 million. And I think that you're going to see that kind of become sort of the norm now, as opposed to the six plus million that it was before that. I think that you're going to see a lot more casual interest that comes around for the women's game when it comes to the NCAA tournament specifically. But as we were talking about earlier in the show, those young stars like Hidalgo and Watkins and others, it's really on them now to kind of take the baton and run with it and continue to draw in those casual fans with their play. I agree. All right. Decaf is off to watch the Cubs. I had a couple more questions I wanted to throw in here. At the end, Tommy, what's one movie or TV character death that was the hardest for you to get over? Have you thought about this one at all? Um, I've got three. I'll, I'll oh, do mine. Wow. I'll do mine. Uh, number one, Goose in Top Gun. When Goose died, that's at the top of my list. Like, <laughs> that's how do you get like, it's like the movie is so good until you get to that point, And then it's like. Oh man, it's just like Goose died and watching, you know, Tom Cruise go in the water to get him and all that. Like that's like the ultimate, that, that was, that's the toughest one for me. Number two, Rob Stark, Game of Thrones, when he died in the Red Wedding episode. Thanks for ruining it for me. (laughs) Well, here's a, here's, here's a non-spoiler, spoiler. The episode was not actually called Red Wedding. It has just been dubbed the Red Wedding because of, you know, they, he died at the Red Wedding. But, like, you were ever going to go back and actually watch it. That's number two. Number three, Henry Blake. Colonel Henry Blake. When Henry died on MASH. When his plane went down in the Sea of Japan. Those are my top three. Um, Um, I would have to go with Tony Stark in the Avengers movie. Okay. AKA Iron Man. Oh, thanks for that spoiler. I didn't know Tony Stark died. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then next would be my good friend Mufasa from Lion King. <laughs> All 
All right. I guess that shows where we are generationally. <laughs> so <laughs> I just don't have the recall like you do. I and I, I I've not seen nearly as many movies as you. Well, I mean, I do have a couple years on you, so I guess that has something to do with that. I like that question. That was a good one, Tommy. Andre, uh, you know, we were talking about the cards earlier. He says he wants a WNBA rookie card for Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. Do you know if they're pumping those out just yet, Jesse? Like, are they, I have are they not on, seen any uh, <laughs> Angel Reese or Caitlin Clark. I've been too uh, infatuated with my Jackson Holiday card. I, uh, I've been actually battling the markets because I was like, you know, I don't want this guy to get too big because that's it's it's like I feel like it's kind of the stock market, right? He's going to make his debut, and if he mm -hmm. plays really well, the price is just going to continue to you know go up, up, up. So I'm trying to get it kind of I guess before he before he pops. So that you was my so. rationale. I hope so. Andre wants to know when we're getting more whiteboard stuff. Didn't we kind of say maybe after the blue gold game you could yeah. break out some whiteboard? We would we would give some analysis based off of some some personnel and groupings that we see from, from Mike Denbrock offensively. What do you think about this one from DK? He says, you're so young, you think the NBA plays <laughs> defense. I was in a little bit of a chat war with some people. I'm just going to leave it at this. The guy that we – like the NBA today, there are so many more people who can create baskets for themselves off the dribble. Like just the talent is so much greater than it was – 20 years ago. And so while it looks like bad defense, it's just incredible offense. We've never seen guys like Kevin Durant, Michael Porter Jr., um, Steph Curry, you know, uh, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard. Like I just, we've never seen basketball players like this. And then, you know, back in the day, you could close line players on defense and not even get a foul. Like it's, it's, you know, I, I understand they've taken some of the physicality out of it. And you know, I don't like the ticky tack fouls at you know at times either, but I don't think it's to blame a uh, bad defense. I just think that the, the scorers are that good these days. I think that it's more of that than I think it's kind of a cliche to say the NBA doesn't play defense. They're not allowed to play defense the way they did back in the eighties and right into the nineties with all the physicality, but because of the level of play, it's just it's tough. Joe wants me to share the athletic. Um Login. Show up tomorrow, Joe, and maybe I'll give you guys a little surprise. So, want to want to keep it legal, but it's like you, we'll... these people expect the to these these the basketball games to be played like football in terms of physicality. Just because guys aren't you know tackling each other in the paint anymore, it's like not good basketball. Yes, I'm, they're they're literally you know, and I've I've come around you know, myself. On the NBA, I'm not. You never I'm not, watched the NBA. Now I'm not the biggest NBA, NBA fan, but I will say they are some of the greatest athletes in the world, and that just by definition makes playing defense when you've got some of the greatest athletes in the world playing offense. It makes them very tough to guard, especially when you don't when you're not allowed. You know some of that physical contact, right? Like like you used are to there say. rules in the NBA that I think should be tweaked a hundred percent. Yeah. But I just, if they, I mean, if they let them play defense like they did in the 80s, guys would be in the hospital. <laughs> that's what I mean. Every night, you know, because again, these guys are still bigger and, and stronger now. Joe says he was made way more into the bird Jordan era. Me too. Like I pretty much stopped after Jordan retired having any real, you know, like deep interest in the NBA. Not that I was a huge Jordan fan, but like that's when the NBA was still really interesting to me. But NBA's got a pretty good uh, pretty good audience themselves right now. I think basically the second best audience viewership wise to the NFL. The NFL rules everything. All right, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up with that as we teetered into basketball talk at the end. We'll have more Notre Dame football talk on tomorrow's show, though, so we will be here. I hope you will as well. And again, we'll be talking about some of Dane Brugler's NFL draft evaluations of the Notre Dame guys. Guess we'll, we'll be, be back, back again. <laughs> Whether you love me or hate me, you get four days in a row, baby. That's right, baby. That's right. Vince is just chilling over there in Penland. All right. 
So that's going to do it. Hit the like button before you leave. Subscribe, rate, and review. Thanks for being here. Good good uh, questions tonight on the mailbag, and we will talk to you tomorrow on IB Nation Sports Talk.